The next item of business is a statement by Shona Robson on delivering an enhanced trauma network for Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Shona Robson. Uh, ten minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am uh, pleased to be able to set out the next steps in the creation of an enhanced trauma network for Scotland. This builds on the excellent services already provided by NHS staff across the country and will lead to full implementation of four major trauma centres in Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh and Glasgow. The dedication of our NHS staff in delivering trauma care is beyond question. These plans will help support them to achieve even more. That's why through the new enhanced network, our trauma teams up and down the country will work together and with the Scottish Ambulance Service to make sure that patients facing life-threatening injuries receive the best care possible as quickly as possible. A trauma network provides clinical leadership throughout the entire patient journey, not just in a trauma centre. From trauma prevention right through to rehabilitation in the community, trauma centres sit at the heart of a trauma network providing multi-specialty care for severely injured patients. They provide consultant level care and are fully equipped to provide definitive care for the most severely injured people with multiple serious and complex injuries to the head, chest and body. Uniquely, trauma centres provide a, a dedicated trauma service. A trauma service is a highly specialist team expert in major trauma care. It has a dedicated trauma ward, which is led by specialist trauma consultants supported by doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists and other health professionals on a 24-7 basis. The last vital component of any trauma network are existing hospitals called trauma units. They deal with the vast majority of trauma, those who are not as seriously injured as major trauma patients. A trauma network cannot succeed without all of these vital components in place. It should therefore come as no surprise that trauma networks require significant planning and investment uh, to, uh, in order to resource them appropriately and give seriously injured patients the best care possible. There has been a rigorous debate in the clinical community as to what the optimum model for Scotland would be. I'm grateful to them and the Chief Medical Officer for shaping the plans that we are now taking forward. In September 2013, the National Planning Forum's Major Trauma Subgroup produced a report with a number of recommendations for the development of a major trauma network. They recommended that a trauma network should be developed and that as a first step, this should be a four centre model. However, they also recognised that there was no clear consensus among clinicians as to what the optimum number of centres was. In April 2014, my predecessor, Alec Neal, asked for the, the suggested four centre model to be taken forward as a practical first step. But in line with the 2013 National Planning Forum report, we knew that the findings of the Geospatial Evaluation of Systems of Trauma Care, or GEOS, study should be taken into account when considering future configurations of a trauma network in Scotland, including whether the number of major trauma centres can and should be reduced further from four major trauma centres and where the optimal locations might be. The fieldwork of the GEOS study was conducted in 2014 and the report was compiled thereafter. The GEOS study was noted on a number of occasions by the National Planning Forum Major Trauma Oversight Group as they took forward their work. In 2015, the GEOS study cast doubt on the four centre model and instead suggested two trauma centres was the optimal configuration for Scotland. I had a choice whether to ignore the GEOS report, accept it or ask that further work was done to assess the relative benefits and risks of this alternative model. I judged that this report had to be fully considered to ensure the right model for Scotland was being developed and to try to address clinical concerns. Clinicians and other NHS staff then worked tirelessly with the GEOS study group to assess the risks of having just two centres. And in the spring of last year, it became clear from that further work that those risks outweighed the notional benefits. The views and concerns of clinicians and the Scottish Ambulance Service on a two-centre model were critical at this stage. As a result, I asked the Chief Medical Officer to lead an implementation group that would look at how 
a new trauma network based around the original model of four major trauma centres in Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh and Glasgow could be made to work in practice, taking cognizance of the lessons learned from the GEOSH report, the concerns of the Scottish Ambulance Service and Scotland's unique geography. In June last year, the Scottish Government announced that we'd have the necessary preparatory work for an enhanced four-centre trauma network completed by December 2016. A commitment repeated in our programme for government and we have now delivered that. As part of building a consensus around the model, the Chief Medical Officer has visited clinicians across the country to get views on what the model should look like and how it could be made to work in practice. All of this has been done with expert advice, collaboration and support from our NHS throughout, meeting the commitments set out in our programme for government. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Chief Medical Officer for her hard work and perseverance in taking forward this complex project. The Chief Medical Officer's report, Saving Lives, Giving Life Back, sets out how we will deliver an agreed and unique network model of trauma care in Scotland. One that will enhance trauma services across Scotland and deliver improved outcomes for our most severely injured patients. There has been a great deal of good work done in parallel to, in de to developing the network model, complementary initiatives that can and will help to make the trauma network sustainable and simultaneously start us on the road to delivering enhanced trauma care. So early progress will include the Scottish Ambulance Service Trauma Desk will be expanded to operate 24-7 so that patients can be triaged appropriately and access definitive trauma care as quickly as possible. The trauma desk will be up and running by October. A triage tool that helps paramedics quickly identify major trauma patients and tells them where they should be taken will be tested in the summer. The Scottish Ambulance Service are going to recruit additional staff with the aim of having staff in place by July. And vital trauma equipment for all um, Scottish Ambulance Service vehicles has already been procured and it will be in universal use by the end of February of this year. We also anticipate that both Aberdeen and Dundee taking a shorter period of time to establish trauma centres over the next 12 to 18 months. This will be guided by the Scottish Trauma Network Steering Group and set out in a national phased implementation plan later this year. It's extremely important to note that the steering group's plans will not be developed in isolation. Clinicians from all regions, including Aberdeen and Dundee, have been fully involved in the development of the network model and will continue to be fully involved as the network develops. The new trauma network model and the way forward is now fully supported by healthcare professionals across Scotland and the Scottish Ambulance Service. They'll continue to work with the new network steering group and the trauma centres and hospitals within their area to deliver the changes needed. We're investing an extra £5 million in 2017-18 to accelerate these improvements. Over the lifetime of implementation, the anticipated cost of the new enhanced network and four centre model is approximately £30 million. The final cost will be informed by the development of the network steering group's plans. This new network will not only benefit people with major trauma, 6,000 of Scotland's seriously injured patients each year, of whom around 1,100 will have major trauma injuries, will benefit. And once fully operational, we expect an additional 40 lives can be saved, but many more will go on to have an improved quality of life due to improved rehabilitation pathways. If members still have any doubt about the scale and complexity of what we're trying to achieve, I would urge them to speak to the doctors and NHS staff that have been involved in developing this network model. The 11th of January marked an important day in changing trauma care in Scotland for the better. Through the, this network, we will provide world-class trauma care that will save more lives and help thousands more people make a better recovery and get on with their everyday lives. I'm confident that the right model has come out of all of this work and that this will enhance our trauma services and save more lives uh, every year. I'm proud of the efforts of our NHS staff who have, who have helped us steer through this very complex and difficult process. And I'm very happy to take questions on this statement. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement and I'll allow around 20 minutes for questions. A lot of people want to ask them, so please would all participants bear that in mind. Uh, it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now 
and I call on Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of her statement, but I do find it strange that it had to take calls from Ruth Davidson at last week's FMQs to get her to come to this chamber to address this issue to Parliament. And the fact that the First Minister went to the media instead of telling this Parliament is unacceptable. I wonder, will it always be the case? Will it always be the case we have to apply pressure on the government in these circumstances? Turning to the issue in, in hand, there has been, I am afraid, a complete failure of forward planning here, given that these vital trauma centres were supposed to be in place last year and are now subject to a three-year delay. That delay is intolerable because these are quite literally life-saving centres whose very existence for those with severe injuries will often make all the difference between life and death, as the statement recognises. Given that the week ending the 8th of January 2017 revealed the worst a &E figures since March 2015, and the Scottish Ambulance Service tells us that ambulances are struggling to attend life-threatening call-outs quickly enough, there is clearly serious pressure on the whole a &E and trauma system. So further delay to these trauma centres is just about the last thing the system needs. There is a distinct lack of clarity on another issue. The Scottish Government didn't know how much the new network was going to cost. Not our words, but those of the Scottish Government who told Spice last week that the cost of the Scottish trauma network have yet to be determined. We have now learnt that the network could cost up to 30 million to establish, but we don't know what the running costs will be. With that in mind, and on the basis that the Cabinet Can we Secretary... Can come to the question, please, sorry, Mr Cameron? On the basis that the Cabinet Secretary states the necessary preparatory work is complete, Presumably, she's in a position to confirm what the expected yearly operating costs are for this service. Shona Robson. So, I was very happy to come here and make a statement uh, to Parliament and very happy to set out the detail of the complexity of this and to be able to share uh, with Parliament some of the detail of, of why it was important to reach a consensus among clinicians which previously wasn't there. And I would hope that members across this Parliament would agree with me that it was right to take the time to build that consensus rather than to push ahead with a model that didn't have that clinical buy-in. So I hope that members, in the light of the information, uh, the detailed information provided today, will accept that. So I don't accept Donald Cameron's criticism of a failure of forward planning. This was not an issue of, uh, of, of a lack of forward planning. It was an issue of a lack of clinical consensus which had to be built. And the Chief Medical Officer has done sterling work at doing that, the length and breadth of Scotland. The, the member refers to pressures within our a &E, uh, departments in the Scottish Ambulance Service. Winter always brings pressures and of course what's important with this major trauma network is the additional layer of support that will be provided for those most uh, injured patients, those with major trauma injuries, which we're talking about around 0.2% of all of those, uh, uh, of those um, the 6,000 who are, are injured. It's a very, very small number of people with major trauma that would ever go anywhere near our a &E departments. Most a &E departments see very, very few major trauma patients. So this new layer will help to support those patients who are the, the, the most injured with major trauma injuries. In terms of the cost, uh, the £30 million has been on the public record for quite some time. Uh, what I have said in relation to the, the network is that that £30 million should be taken as a guide for the network to work on, but that the steering group will be doing further detailed work around the phasing of that £30 million. We've already announced £5 million for 2017-18, and I've out outlined in my statement what those early priorities for that spend will be. I hope that, that gives Donald uh, Cameron some clarity. Anna Sarwar. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement. This is the second time that this Cabinet Secretary has attempted to hide behind the First Minister and then been forced to this Parliament to explain her failures. She promised that the trauma network would be delivered by 2016. This is now delayed until 2020, at least. On their own figures, 6,000 patients expected to benefit each year, meaning that up to 18,000 patients will be failed by this Cabinet Secretary. I listened with interest to the Cabinet Secretary saying with a straight face 
that I quote, were interested in were investing an extra £5 million in 2017-18 to accelerate these improvements. Only in Shona Robinson's world is a delay of three years an acceleration. Now, one of the excuses the Cabinet Secretary gave for the delay is that it was a debate between two or four trauma centres. Well, we always knew that two of the trauma centres would be in, England, would be in Glasgow and Edinburgh. So can she tell us why these are not up and running already? And in conclusion, the Cabinet Secretary likes to talk about England. Well, the fact is that under this Cabinet Secretary, these new major trauma centres will be delivered 10 years after the NHS in England. Will she take this opportunity to apologise? Shona Robson. Uh, well, we give um, op the opposition copies of the statement an hour in advance so they can read the statement and then frame their questions based on the statement uh, content. It's quite clear that Anna Sarwar has done neither of those things. Uh, if he had listened or if he had read the statement and then if he had listened to the statement, he would have seen quite clearly why it has taken time to reach a consensus among the clinical community of the right model for Scotland. And I would reiterate what I have said. It was very important that that uh, consensus was built around the clinical community in order to have a sustainable major uh, uh, trauma network to benefit the people of Scotland. Anna Sarwar shows how ill-informed he is by saying, just to paraphrase, that 18,000 people will somehow not, uh, will be missing out on good trauma care. How ill-informed that is, because if he'd listened to the detail of this, he would have heard that 6,000 people a year who experience trauma in Scotland already get first-rate treatment and care for their injuries through our existing through our existing network of A&E departments. What we're talking about here is the 1,100 people within that 6,000 who have major trauma injuries. If he'd listened to the detail and read the statement, he would have seen that detail. What we're talking about is 1,100 people with major trauma injuries who will be treated within these new major trauma networks. They already get excellent care. What this is about is providing optimal care Still and importantly listening. about rehabilitation. Perhaps if Anna Sarwar listened to anyone other than himself, he might learn something from this. We move to the open questions. And I have Fulton McGregor followed by Miles Briggs and quick questions and answers, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind the Chamber that I'm the Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Cabinet Secretary to ask the Scottish Government when the four trauma regions will have detailed implementation plans in place. Shona Robson. Uh, can I say, I, I don't know what the Labour benches find so amusing about the development of a major trauma network that could save 40 lives a year. Perhaps they need to take this subject a little more seriously than they are. But can I say to Fulton uh, McGregor in terms of his question about the, uh, the when the four trauma regions will have detailed imp implementation plans in place. We expect the four regional trauma networks and the Scottish Ambulance Service to have their regional implementation plans completed by October of this year. These plans will inform the completion of a, a phased uh, national implementation plan for the entire trauma network, which will, be, which will be ready by the end of the year. As I said in my statement, Aberdeen and Dundee are, uh, will be the trailblazers for the network. They are ahead of uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh at this stage, and it is quite right that we support them to get on with the establishment of, them, of the major trauma centres for Aberdeen and Glasgow, which will then be followed by Edinburgh and Glasgow in due course. Miles Briggs and then Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to publishing all the materials and documents, including details of ministerial discussions around the decisions to support four trauma sites? And how will the trauma site network form part of the workforce planning strategy? And when will Parliament receive information regarding this? Shona Robson. Uh, well, can I say to, to Miles Briggs that quite a lot of this information is already in the public domain. The, the GEOS study, for example, is already in the public domain. So a lot of that material is already in the public domain. But if there's other material that would be helpful uh, to Miles Briggs and others, and I'll certainly look uh, at his request. Uh, in terms of the workforce plan, of course, uh, this will form part of the, the workforce plan. Although it should be remembered, as I said in my statement, that uh, this is about enhancing the existing uh, 
uh, trauma capability by adding this major trauma uh, network layer uh, on top of our trauma services that already exist. Now, part of that will be staffing resources to make sure that they have the adequ adequate staffing because it requires not just those working on the front line, but the staff behind. So yes, I can confirm that that will be part of the, the workforce plan which we'll be bringing forward in the spring. Lewis MacDonald and then Alex Cole Hamilton. I hope the Cabinet Secretary, having uh, no doubt spoken as I have to those involved in developing plans for a major trauma centre in Aberdeen, will understand their frustration uh, that even at this stage the Government is not yet ready to go. However, I've read closely Catherine Calderwood's report published last week and I listened closely to what she had to say. If indeed Aberdeen Royal Infirmary will be ready to provide a dedicated new trauma ward this year, if indeed a full-blown major trauma centre could be established at Forrester Hill within the next 12 to 18 months. What, what is holding up uh, these deployments going forward? Is the issue, as Catherine Calderwood seems to say, uh, that staffing is a constraint? Why will she not now put in place the regional trauma network for the north of Scotland that she's talked about? What is to prevent that happening now? Shona Robson. Uh, well, can I say, I think there would have been a great deal more frustration uh, in Aberdeen in the North East had we gone ahead with the two centre model that came to my desk which we had to give consideration to because, well, the, the member says, why? Well, when a group of clinicians come and cast doubt on the sustainability of a clinical model that you're pursuing, it would be quite reckless not to listen to that clinical advice. What we then had to do, though, was to try to build and rebuild a consensus around the four-centre model, which is what the Chief Medical Officer has taken forward with the clinical community, and we now have that, and that's very important if we're going to have a model that is sustainable and of course it is unique and bespoke to Scotland. It's not based on centres and networks elsewhere, based on major populations. It takes into account very much Scotland's unique geography. Now, in terms of taking forward Aberdeen and Dundee, as I've said, the 12 to 18 month time frame uh, I think is realistic for the, the two centres that are I, I think out of, the, out of the, the stops most quickly. They are very keen to get up and running. The steering group will be setting out uh, the work that needs to be taken uh, over the next few months. As I laid out in my statement, an important component of that before anything else happens is the Scottish Ambulance Service having their 24-7 trauma desk and making sure that as a triage service, they uh, have their enhanced services in place. I would then want to see very quickly the detail of how Aberdeen and Dundee will be getting up and running, getting the trauma wards up and running, getting the staffing in place. So very happy to keep Lewis MacDonald informed of some of the detail of that as we take it forward. I'm sure the CMO will do likewise. Alex Paul Hamilton, followed by Claire Hawkey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of her statement. With increasing pressure on every aspect of primary and acute care, getting triage right will be absolutely essential, and I welcome the improvements outlined in the statement to that end. When the last trauma survey was conducted in the 1990s, the injury severity scale was calibrated so that scores of 16 or more on that scale were classified as serious trauma. Despite advances in triage around head trauma, head injury of any magnitude is still always given an automatic score of 16. To prevent inundation of our new trauma centres for, from the automatic, automatic referral of head injury when the patient could receive exemplary and appropriate care in local hospitals, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to reviewing the injury severity scale in respect of head injury to take account advances in triage in that area, whilst not, of course, compromising on patient safety? Shona Robson. Uh well, I mean, I'm happy to, to write to Alex Cole Hamilton around the detail of his question, but I think we have to be very clear here that the definition of major trauma is, is very specific. These are the 1,100 cases within the 6,000 uh, serious injuries that, have, that involve major trauma, including major uh, head injuries and major trauma to, to the head. So it's a very specific uh, group of patients who require the services of uh, major trauma teams. And uh, as I say, very happy to write to Alex Cole Hamilton, but hopefully uh, he will appreciate that we're talking about a very small number of people out of those who uh, have serious injuries. Claire Hockey, followed by Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how effective communications on the development of the new network will be delivered to both clinicians and the public. 
Um, Robson. Yep. Can I uh, say to Claire Hawkey that the new Scottish Trauma Network Steering Group will work closely with clinicians and NHS staff from the four trauma regions to maintain effective communications to ensure that the National Trauma Network is implemented. The new Scottish Trauma Network website will also serve as an effective communications I'll, I'll serve as, a, as an effective communications tool which will help to, for example, keep clinicians and the public informed and indeed members of this parliament informed as the network develops. The new trauma website is available at uh, traumacare.scot and I would uh, hope that members might uh, avail themselves of the information on that. Ross Thompson and then Ivan McKee. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In her statement, the Cabinet Secretary stated, we are investing an extra five million in 1718 to accelerate these improvements. Of this five million fund to mitigate against the delay, can the Cabinet Secretary clarify how much of this fund will be allocated to the Aberdeen Trauma Centre and how much does she expect will be required to deliver the Aberdeen Trauma Centre on time? Shona Robson. Well, can I say to Ross Thompson that I laid out in my statement what the uh, initial priorities are for that five million spend, which included the, uh, the development and enhancement of services in the Scottish Ambulance Service, because I'm sure the member will appreciate without the Scottish Ambulance Service being able to triage through its 24-7 uh, trauma desk, then the, that is the glue uh, in the rest of the network. What we've asked the steering group to do is to develop some of the, the more detailed costings, which will include the development of Aberdeen and Dundee over the 12 to 18 month period, which goes beyond the 5 million, obviously, um, and that work will be ongoing. Um, the 12 to 18 month period obviously straddles two financial years, and I will want to make sure that in planning for 18-19, any uh, additional costs of, of developing Aberdeen and Dundee are included within that. Very happy to keep Ross Thompson uh, informed as the detail of that work goes forward. Ivan McKee, followed by Jenny Mara. Uh, thank you. I'm going to thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement. Based on some of the questions that have been asked already this afternoon, it's clear some members haven't read the CMO report and don't understand the concept of a trauma network. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide details of the additional services that will be provided by the major trauma centres over and above those already provided for in local emergency hospitals and how all of those services combine with ambulance service in the Scottish Trauma Network to improve patient outcomes through the trauma pathway. Shona Robson. Well, as I said in my uh, statement, severely injured patients already receive excellent trauma care in Scotland. And we should remember that this isn't about people not getting trauma care at the moment. They already get trauma care. This is about optimising the, the trauma care for the most severely injured, those suffering major trauma. And uniquely, uh, major trauma centres provide a, a specialist dedicated to trauma service, as I outlined in my statement involving a highly specialist team expert in major trauma care um, with a dedicated trauma ward uh, led by specialist trauma consultants supported by doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists and other health professionals on a 24 seven basis. The trauma units in other hospitals will support the major trauma centres. They deal with the vast majority of trauma and will continue to do so those who are not as seriously injured as major trauma patients. The trauma network will provide clinical leadership through the entire patient journey, not just in the trauma centre, but from trauma prevention right through to rehabilitation in the community. And importantly, clinicians in the trauma centres will be able to support those colleagues in the trauma units and beyond when dealing with trauma cases and will help to develop and enhance the skill level uh, of uh, all of those staff working together to ensure that the patient gets to the right place quickly and has the best outcomes possible. Jenny Mara followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. The Chief Medical Officer has said that she anticipates Dundee to have its trauma ward operational this calendar year. The Cabinet Secretary this afternoon keeps saying 18, sorry, 12 to 18 months in respect to Dundee and Aberdeen. Can she agree with Catherine Calderwood's expected timescale on the opening? And can she tell Parliament if there are any other factors other than funding and workforce that Catherine Calderline outlines that will affect the timeline of the opening of these centres? Shona Robson. 
Well, as I set out in my statement, the first thing that has to happen is the enhancement of the Scottish Ambulance Service, because they are the triage organisation that will get the major trauma patient to the right place. So you've got to have that up and running first on a 24-7 basis through the trauma desk. So that has to be the first thing that happens. And I set out in the statement the timeline for doing that over the next uh, few months. Uh, I, having met with the the, those who are leading uh, the major trauma centre in Dundee, they are uh, trailblazers for this, frankly. They want to get on with delivering the centre in Dundee. They are very keen. They are getting on with the job. Some things have already changed and are already in place that wasn't there previously to enhance the patient uh, um, experience within nine wells who, of, of patients who have suffered major trauma. So improvements have already been made. So yes, I can confirm that. Um, and uh, the issues of funding and workforce um, are, I mean, in the main, this is about making sure that they have the equipment and that they have the skills uh, available to them. And most of those skill sets are already there, but it will have to be enhanced. And Dundee are looking at that at the moment in terms of what new uh, staffing will be required to deliver this centre. But I'm very optimistic that it can be delivered within the CMO's timescale. The last of the questions, I'm afraid. Uh, Stuart McMillan, very quickly, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, the statement uh, indicates the lifetime implementation cost will be approximately £30 million. But can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how investment in the trauma network in future years will be determined? Shona Robson. Uh, well, as I've uh, said uh, already today, the, the detail of the, the costings uh, will be developed by the steering group. The £30 million, uh, figure is one that has been on the public record for quite some time, and I'm happy to confirm that as a, a guideline budget. But within that, the phasing of the spend over uh, the, the next three years is going to be important in the detail of that, given that what we're talking about here is a, a network that is quite different from the original model envisaged uh, will have to be done. So that detailed work will be taken forward by the steering group. Again, very happy to keep Parliament updated on that.